Hi everyone, I'm Rose Martin and we are right around the corner at Lord Botetourt High School with Bruce Ingram. This high school teacher not only writes about the outdoors and living the locavore lifestyle, thousands of articles to his name, but he also writes books interesting for high school kids. And we're going to talk about ninth grade blues and 10th grade angst and wondering what might happen in 11th grade. Bruce, thank you so much for inviting us here into your classroom. It's been a while since I've been in an English classroom in a high school. Well, thank you for coming. I was, I'm very excited about this. Well, we're so excited to learn about you, and you've been a teacher for 30 years. It's probably 40 or so. Congratulations. So. One of your kids was telling me while we were getting set up that you often tell them that you're the oldest thing at the, Barata, <laughs> at the high school here. Is that true? Um, that's what the rumor is. I'm, I'm, I'll be 66 uh, in April, so um, yeah, I think I'm the oldest person here. You know, it's such a gift. Coming from an education background myself, I know what a difference you make in the lives of these kids. Let's go back to when you were a little boy. Um, looking at your first part body of work, because it's so diverse, you write so much about the outdoors and about fishing and living this locavore lifestyle. What is that? The first five books I wrote were on fishing and floating rivers. And I was tired of that. And Elaine, my wife, uh, we we live out in the country and we try to be really self-sufficient and I try to kill uh, um, deer for the red meat that we eat and then our goal every summer is to pick 10 gallons of wild berries and then we have all these wild fruits and nuts we like to gather in the fall and then we have a garden and raise chickens and we have solar panels and we heat with wood and I, I mentioned that one time to one of my publishers and he said, that's a book. And I thought, yeah, it is. And so Christmas break 2015, I wrote Living the Local World Lifestyle over the Christmas holiday. Over the holiday you wrote it? Wow. Yeah. So it was just waiting to come out. Yeah, it was just. That book was there. It, I was, the publisher had given me the, I told him the idea in an email after he'd been telling me to start the book. And Kendall Lively, our librarian, I told her about it. And the last day before uh, Christmas break that year, Kendall said, when are you going to write that Locavore book? And I said, tomorrow, I'm going to start. <laughs> and I was just on a whim that I said that to her, and I started the next day. Now, this lifestyle and living in this love for the outdoors and this passion for the land, did you grow up that way as a little boy? No. Um, Elaine and I grew up in the suburbs. I lived in Salem. She lived in Clifton Forge. And, but I always was attracted to the outdoors and I didn't like school at all. And um, I'm sure my school teachers in along the way would have been shocked that I'm five years past retirement as a teacher and still teaching and I'm gonna be here next year and looking forward to that. I was not the type of kid that any of them would have predicted would be a teacher. Because you always wanted to be outside? I didn't like school. Mm -hmm. I despised it. Mm -hmm. And it got worse every year I was there. And, um, but I've always wanted to, ever since the 11th grade, I, that was the year I decided I was going to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. But I did not, I was not a good student. And I was not, I didn't make good grades. And I didn't like my time in high school. So let's go back to when you were a little boy and learning how to fish. With, uh, with your granddad, or you would sneak out and go fishing? What's that story? Nobody, uh, nobody in my family fished or hunted, and I was the only one who wanted to go, and I was punished severely for going fishing, which made me want to go even more. And if this was the forbidden pleasure of life, and that you shouldn't go do this was a waste of time, that made me want to go do it. And then I really enjoyed being outside, and I didn't start hunting till I was an adult uh, because there was nobody to mentor me. Mm -hmm. You need a mentor to be a hunter. And then I just really enjoyed that. And I've always enjoyed tree identification and bird identification, and everything out there in the woods is a is a is a something to behold. And I wanted to be able to identify all the trees and identify all the birds and identify all the fish and minnow, every minnow and every crayfish. So I was, I just really enjoyed the biology of it all and 
when I, the first story I ever wrote, I was in 1981, and it was about fishing a creek, which was something I did. Mm -hmm. And then um, I sold that story to Virginia Wildlife Magazine in 1981. And then the next eight magazine articles I wrote were all rejected. And I thought I was just going to quit writing. It was just too much humiliation and too much stress to be constantly rejected. And I tell this story to the kids in creative writing sometimes about my failures, which they seem to enjoy because mm -hmm. it shows, you know, you, sometimes you don't succeed. And so two years passed. I'd, I'd quit writing, and I had a friend at Camp Easter Seal in Craig County. And he had told me that they were having a, a handicapped hunt over there that uh, disabled hunters were going to be in wheelchairs hunting for deer in blinds. And would I come over and, and cover that story because I had, he'd read that other one that I'd written. And I said, I'm through writing. I'm, I can't write. Nobody will buy it. He says, please come over. These men have, we put a lot of work to get this. Try, try to do one more story or try, if you fail, that's okay, but try to come because we don't have anybody to come to write about this and we think this is pretty special. And I said, well, nobody's going to buy what I write because I've had eight straight rejections. And so I came over there, wrote the story, and I thought, I'm going to send it to the biggest outdoor magazine in the country, Outdoor Life. Mm -hmm. And um, so I wrote up the story, sent it away, and a couple of weeks later, they, the letter came back from the editor. And said, Dear Mr. Ingram, I'm so sorry that you're hunting from a wheelchair. We admired your courage so much. Of course, we'll buy your story. And the kids all laugh at that because, right? And I, and they, I had written the story so poorly that they thought I was in a wheelchair, and I was so humiliated. So I wrote to the editor and said, "I'm sorry, I wrote it so badly that you couldn't tell." I said, "I said, I, you know, I apologize for that." He says, "That's okay, I can fix it." He said, "Would you like to try to write for us some more?" And I thought he's going to give me another chance, and. I'll, and so I wrote another story, he bought it, and then I thought, well, if I'm writing for Outdoor Life, I can try all these other publications. And then my career just, just took off. Mm. And it was, because, it was, and I'd quit, you know, I, because of the frustration. So I tell that to the students sometimes, that, you know, sometimes that you, you have a mentor. And those articles did take off, because over 2,000, uh, It's articles? close to 2,400. Wow. Yeah. So you've, you've mentioned Elaine a couple of times. An interesting story. You met at camp and you weren't sure if she would go out with you? Yeah. Um, we met at Camp Easter Seal in 1974. And I, the first time I met her was in the laundry room over there. We, we were coming over there to do laundry and I, she, I was spellbound by her. And I, I thought, this is the girl. This is the You knew one. right then. Yeah. And... She was so sweet and everything, but she was so nice to everybody. And that, that whole summer, I had a crush on her and wanted to ask her out. And she always had boyfriends. And then in the summer of 75, we came back and I was gonna ask her out, that was my goal. And I t t took her and another girl canoeing. And my plan was to ask Elaine out, or at least ask the girl that flirted with me the most out. And I tell this story to the kids too. And Elaine did not even talk to me that evening. She just sat there like she was miserable, and the other girl flirted and flirted and flirted. So I asked the other girl out, and we dated that summer. But the one I wanted to date was Elaine. And then the next summer, I came back to camp, deciding this time for sure, no matter what, I was gonna ask her out, and she didn't come back to camp that summer. And I was crushed. And then another year went by, and I still had, the, this infatuation for her and in, there was a camp reunion in 77 and um, I made sure that the organizers for the reunion got her phone number and called her and I thought if, if she comes in there without a ring on her hand I'm going to ask her out for sure and she came in there without a ring on her hand and then I was at intimidated by her beauty and her charm and her personality again and I, I spent three hours talking to her trying to work, summon up enough courage to ask her out and so I asked her out and she 
gets out a date book, which is a bad sign. <laughs> and she said, I have a date this Friday night. I can't go out with you. I said, well, how about Saturday night? And she turned the page and she said, no, I have a date that Saturday night too. I can't go out with you. I said, well, how about two weeks from now? <laughs> either Friday or Saturday. So she turns the pages and she says, I'm sorry, I have dates for Friday and Saturday night. So I thought, well, this is the girl I pined for three years. I'm gonna go one more week. I said, how about three weeks from now, Friday or Saturday? And she turns, she says, I'm sorry, I have a date for Friday night, but I'm open three weeks from now on a Saturday. I'll pencil you in. <laughs> and I what thought- What a great story. And I thought, wow, I'll take it. And I said, that'd be, so it is a date. So I, she said, yes. But she calls me three days later and she says she has an unexpected opening for this coming Friday night, two or three days from now. Would I, be, would I like our first date to be then? I said, sure, sure. And so she says, well, there's a dinner play, a, a play and a dinner up here in Clifton Forge area. Can you come up for that? And I says, yes, I'm, I mean. Whatever. Whatever, it doesn't matter to me. So I'm so excited to finally have a date with her. And we get out of the car and um, I go over and hold her hand for the first time. And we get inside and she says, I'm sorry. She says, I didn't like it when you held my hand. And then she said, but then I did. Oh. And we, we talked that night I clean forgot that she had another date for the Saturday after that. I said, you want to go do something tomorrow evening? And she said, yes. So the next night we stayed up till like 2, 2 p.m. talking. We had two more dates and then on our fifth date, um, we decided to get married. Oh, what a beautiful yeah. story. And the reason I've been able to, to juggle all these things, you know, books and magazine articles and teaching is she, she, does all this stuff for me that I don't have to do. Like she gets the car inspected and she does the grocery shopping so that I can write and she buys my clothes. I mean, I, don't, I haven't been in the mall this century. So mm -hmm. she helps me so much with the, the busy stuff of life so that I can do the writing and everything. And, but she co-wrote Living the Local Board Lifestyle. She did all the recipes and then she edited the book as well. And she has done over, she sold over 100 magazine articles. Wonderful. So she's and you write a, so tenderly about her. We'll be married 40 years in June, and it's just time has flown by. And some of the best things I've written have been about her. The best, the best thing I've ever written was a magazine article I wrote about her, her breast cancer. Mm. And, um, I, and, and I wrote about that and how we met. Is that why you celebrate half your anniversaries? Well, we decided when we'd been married six months, that we were gonna go out to dinner. And then every year, um, for, for 39 and a half years, you know, every, we go out to Coach and Four, which is where we went the first time, and we always have dinner there. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's a big deal to have our half year anniversary. Um, that's so sweet. Yeah, it's been a wonderful life. I mean, how many, the, the things I wanted was, a good, the first thing I wanted, the most important thing, was a good wife. And then I wanted to have kids and, be, and be a, try to be a good parent. And then I wanted, to, I wanted to teach, and I wanted to write, and I wanted to live out in the country. And, and have land to, to live on, and a creek to fish in, and to go out my back door and be out in nature. And I've had all that. Mm -hmm. And everything, has, everything good started with her. And then everything else just fell into place. Mm -hmm. And, uh, are your children writers? Our children are teachers. Wonderful. Uh, our, our daughter, Sarah, te is a school teacher, and our daughter, Mark, uh, teaches English in Alaska. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and our daughter, uh, Sarah, is, teaches third grade for uh, Ronald City Schools. How did you transition from this outdoor writing articles and living the locavore lifestyle to involving students with ninth grade blues and 10th grade angst? How did that transition happen? Okay, there was, there's a lot to, the, to that. After I'd done the five uh, books on, the, on fishing and flooding rivers, I, I enjoyed that, it was, it, was, it was a great thing to do, but I, I couldn't do that anymore. I wanted something different. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you don't wanna, you wanna continue progress as a writer. And I talked to the kids about that in creative writing too, that you wanna progress and do different things. So I felt like I'd done that and I didn't wanna do that anymore. 
And then we wrote about how we lived and living the local rural lifestyle. And, but that was, you know, there was no need for a part two. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do something different for the seventh book, but I wasn't sure what. And Kendall Lively, the librarian at school, she, she Skypes with these young adult fiction novelists. And she's so good at, at helping the kids um, get excited about learning and reading. And she was Skyping with all these young adult fiction writers. And this was April of 2016, and this little idea started popping into my head that you could do this, you could do this. And then there was this other little idea that says, no, you can't, no, you can't. And I, I need to go back a little bit. I tried writing fiction once a decade in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s trying to write short stories. And all three short stories that I wrote, one per decade, were rejected multiple times by multiple public mm -hmm. publications. And a lady would, would read them, and, and finally after the third one that I wrote in 2004, she said, please stop. Mm. She says, you can't write this. And I think I said, I, you're right. I, I, this is just not me. And she says, you can be good at what you do, which is writing about the outdoors, but this is not you, this is, you're, it's forced. It's not, it doesn't flow. And she was right. What is the process like for you when you get an idea and you want to put it down on paper? I, I don't ever, yeah, I tell the kids, you know, sometimes the kids in English classes and creative writing say, I'm having writer's block, Mr. Ingram. And I tell them no such thing exists. I says, just start writing. Just slop it down and then fix it later. And then they say, well, I've got writer's block. I says, no, you know, there's no such thing. It doesn't exist. Tell yourself it doesn't Do exist. Do you write every day? Yes. I, I don't feel good about myself unless I write every day. You were asking me what I was going to do when I was going to get home. After Elaine and I have dinner and we'll have some time together and talk, then I, I'm going to want to write. And I, write, I wrote this morning, I write this afternoon, and I don't feel good about myself unless I write every day. I, I, it's, you know, other people will watch TV, I'll write, or, you, you know, this is what I do. And, I, I see a lot of great young writers in this school. You know, this, these, a lot of the kids I get for creative writing are just on fire. Which has write. been so exciting with these books because having books that were written about high school kids and these four characters are so interesting. Is Luke at all this outdoor guy who's in high school? Is he based loosely on you? All, the four, all four characters are composites of lots of different kids that I've met and people, even from when I was in high school. I mean, there's multiple people that went into each one of these four characters. How do you involve the students in the editing? Okay. Because that is so interesting that you actually bring these books into your classes and let kids help you. Okay, well, after I, after I finished, when I got the ideas from Miss, Miss Lively, and I finally decided to start writing the book in June of 2016, Ninth Grade Blues, I, I wrote eight chapters and showed them to Elaine because if she didn't like them, it was going to die right there because I knew she would be sweet but blunt. And so she read them. First, she, she groaned when I, she, when I told her I'd written some fiction, and she did something <laughs> like that. And I said, well, just give it a shot. And so she read it, and then she gave me pretty high praise. She said, this isn't bad. And I said, that's what I thought, mm -hmm. that it's not bad. And so I sent it to a publisher. He said, he said, to fin he, says he's in he was intrigued. He says, finish it. So I wrote it a chapter a day that summer because I can't write during school. There's just too much going on. And I've got my magazine work to do. I just can't write a book, do magazine articles, and teach school at the same time. I can write magazine articles and teach school, but I can't do three things. So I wrote, finished it during the summer, and then I had this idea that I would go to Amanda Collins, who was assistant principal here then, and ask her if I could turn it into a joint project with my creative writing class. And she thought that was a wonderful idea. And I told Megan Biggio, our, 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 who was head of the English department, I was working on it, and, and she, was, she was okay with that too. And so I told the kids that we would, um, would they help me proof the book and then change anything that needed to be changed? Okay, wait a minute. So you gave all the kids a book? No, no. You, I get, oh. we, we would project the book onto the screen here. Okay. And um, 
they, they would edit it. What kind of feedback did they give you about the characters and the book? If there was something they did not like or they didn't like the word choice, which is like an SOL thing too, they said, you need to change this. Like, we don't talk this way. This is not what a character yeah, would say Yeah, that's exactly. They were saying okay. that. <laughs> we, this isn't right. This doesn't ring true. And, and every time they were right. I mean, and so we, we I, they proved it. Uh, in September and October, and then in November of 2016, my creative writing class here, we Skyped with the publisher. Mm -hmm. And I had told them that I didn't think he was going to buy it, I didn't think he was going to reject it, he was going to tell me to rewrite it. And I, I said, this is just the way it is. I don't expect things to go smoothly the first time. And they were, uh, you know, they were okay. They said, you know, they had ownership by the end. Right. They had, I mean, this was their book too. And so the publisher comes on, he says, well, what did you think about Ninth Grade Blues? And the kids started talking about it and they were saying, we like this, we like that. And of course they did. They had, you know, they had done a lot, you know, they'd fixed everything that was wrong with it. And, um, and then he said, what do you think about a sequel? And my mouth just dropped. I thought he's bought the first one and wants the second one. And that's exactly what, what had happened. Did you have the same kids working on the first book and the second one? Well, some of them, of course, graduated. And then some of them couldn't take it because of scheduling conflicts. But I had a lot of the same kids work on 10th grade uh, angst that worked on 9th grade blues. So is there an 11th grade coming out? Yes. And the publishers already ordered um, the 11th grade book, which is the, the, kids, the kids named the books. Um, I named 9th grade blues. They named 10th grade angst. And then they told me that the 11th grade book should be called 11th grade stress. Okay. Because, 11th grade stress. Well, Perfect. Because, yeah, because the 11th grade... They say, and they're right, the kids say that the 11th grade is the hardest year of high school, and it's true. Would you read something for us? Okay. And um, I had picked out something here where Luke, this is at the beginning of ninth grade blues, and Luke, who doesn't like school, in fact, the first thing he says in the very first chapter, and then I'll skip to a later chapter, this is how the book begins. I hate the first day of school. I hate school. And I wrote this, one, another reason why I wrote this book is because I wanted a book for kids who don't like to read to have something that they would like to read. And the kids that are having trouble with school, that this would be something that they could relate to. And I, I'm, before I read something, I gotta tell you this. The first time I taught this book was this year. And when we finished the book, the kids had to write an essay test, one of those SOL style essay tests. And one of the things they were dealing with is which character they most related to. And I, I was overwhelmed with what, you know, how the, every one of the characters had students that related to these individuals. And I was just overwhelmed at their identification with them. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to a girl one time, and she was. She said that one of the characters had gone through the same difficult stuff at home that she had gone through, and that the book, the character turned out all right, and she thought maybe she would too. Mm. And that was, she was talking, yep. and she started to cry, and I, I started to cry, and we're sitting in there. And it was just so powerful. And I said, I said, you know, you're going to be okay. And the character in the book is going to be okay. You and really she, made a difference. Yeah. And I said, she says, I know. So we both, we both stopped. And so it made me feel um, that it was worthwhile. That I created something worthwhile. And I didn't tell the first, I'm going to read in a second. I, the first day I taught this, was, which was back in August of this school year, um, I didn't tell the kids on the first day that I had written it because I wanted their honest opinions of whether they liked it or not. And um, so I get to the end of the first day and I said, well, what did y'all think about this book? And th th they were they was overwhelmingly said, I like it, I like it. And I said, well, why? And the most common response was, it's about people our age. And that was one of the reasons I wrote it, because there's not enough out there about people their age. And then the second day in class, we're reading, and one of the kids stops and says, Say, did you write this? <laughs> and I said, yeah, is that okay? He said, okay, yeah, yeah, that's okay. It clicked. Yeah, it clicked, you know. And now another teacher at the school, Miss Rippey, is teaching it. 
and uh, she and Miss Sutton are co-teaching it. And they were t Miss uh, Sutton told me the other day that they were really enjoying it. So, um, yeah. All right, let's hear some. All right. Well, Luke here is in English class, and um, he's called on to read, and he's just in a panic because this is his first time in an honors class, and he doesn't think he belongs. And this is what he says. To my big surprise, the short story is interesting from the start. I'm absolutely shocked. It's about this country boy growing up in this shack with his girl cousin who's very old and has mental issues. And they go out into the woods and creeks and do things with their dog. I can see myself in the boy. Miss Hawk starts out doing all the reading and says everybody's going to read two or three paragraphs. And she calls on me first. No, 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 please no. Maybe she thinks I'm too stupid to be an honors English because of the way I answered the what are you going to do with your life question. And it's going to weed me out of the class early. She's going to send me with a folded stapled note to guidance. I know what that means. I've been sent down a level in math classes. So I take a deep breath, get my nerves together, and read three paragraphs. I don't make a single mistake and don't permit, mispronounce a single word. I'll show her I belong here. Then she asks what the word dilapidated means and can and anyone tell from the context and what does the word context mean? I figure that I don't need to raise my hand because I'm the one that's been reading. So I say that context means figuring out what a word means from the way it's used in a sentence. And that dilapidated means old and worn out like the shack those people are living in. It's the first time I've ever answered in school without the teacher calling on me. Mm. And he feels like for the first time, maybe he can do something. You so. have made such a difference in the lives of these kids. Thank you so much for inviting us here to your classroom. Special thanks to Bruce Ingram and our friends here at Lord Baratat High School for their hospitality. It's been so much fun hearing all about the ups and downs and roller coaster ride of high school through ninth grade blues and 10th grade angst, and also learning about all of Bruce's outdoor adventures and all of the other things he's worked on. Thanks so much for joining us. I'll see you next time right around the corner.